welcome everybody to Audiobooks from Hell. I am your host, Sean DeRager, and uh, it's been a little bit, so I thank you all for your patience. I know I started getting, uh, you know, uh, direct messages and tweets and stuff, like, asking me where I was and if the show was still going on, but it's definitely uh, still happening, so I thank you all for for waiting through, uh, through all this. Um, today, I'm very excited about today's episode. I, um, I've just... I believe it's just hit Audible, but the book Revenant Sun, uh, kind of a cyberpunk science fiction book that I had been narrating, um, hit Audible, and uh, today we are going to be talking to the author. So, Eric Ganhoff, welcome to Audiobooks from Hell. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. We are taking a diversion from horror when I first wanted to do this. I was like, oh, it'll be about you know all the paperbacks and stuff like that. But, you know, I think that genre kind of blends in and out. they kind of they'll they'll kind of bounce in and out of other genres and everything. So I figured I I'll we'll we'll divert here into cyberpunk because you know Revenant Sun. What kind of took me with the story was um, that it was very much kind of a cyberpunk Blade Runner feel, but um, it the way that you wrote it, it wasn't like I guess calling attention to itself. Like hey look we're cyberpunk. Like uh, it's definitely has its rules in the world building. And has that feel, but I liked how kind of organic the storytelling was, um, and, how, and how the characters interacted in that world. So I was really kind of struck by that, and that's why I wanted to uh, to narrate it. So uh, Eric, I wanted to just talk talk to you about uh, you know, I guess cyberpunk in general. I mean, in science fiction, has that been something that you've always kind of pursued as far as when you wanted to dip your toe into writing, or um, what kind of brought you into kind of focusing on science fiction? I think for me, like cyberpunk was something that came in like teenage years. Mm -hmm. I I always wanted to write stories when I was a little kid. So I started off writing about like rainbows and superheroes, but then cyberpunk came on, you know, just kind of watching old movies when I was growing up and Blade Runner really was like the beginning of that for me. So just kind of seeing a world like that, like, kind of fall in love with the world mm-hmm. the music the city the cityscapes that kind of stuff took me like that's always something i wanted to do is i wanted to write something like that but it might take me 10 years 15 years but i always <laughs> wanted to write something as close as i could get to that yeah yeah and that the world building and kind of the attention to detail i think were just fascinating with with this book especially since you know you're a, a young author um this was your third, was it Revenant Sun was your third novel, is that correct? Yeah, but the first book I wrote, actually, it wasn't, it was like a giant 600 page monster of a detective story, <laughs> so I split that into two. So I'm going to call this one my, my second, but okay. one and three are like, they started with the same giant, like, wad of paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, what uh, was, was the first, the first, uh, novel that you did was that was that science fiction as well that one was more of like really inspired by like a lot of different things i just kind of latched on growing up just sort of soaking in all sorts of influences a lot of different literature and films so like that book really is more of like i guess if i could describe it in a way to try to sell it to somebody is like me trying to do like so if revenant sun is like me trying to do blade runner <laughs> black eclipse the black eclipse wasteland heart two-part mystery thing was me trying to do like cowboy bebop anime detective book okay awesome awesome very cool yeah i'm excited to check out those ones we've we've been we've been in discussions about possibly bringing those to audiobook uh so we'll we'll see that'd be fun to do um but um but as far as like like Revenant Sun and, 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 you know, and you mentioned Blade Runner. Um, and what I like about Revenant Sun, I think, is one of the things I like about Blade Runner um, and movies like that. And there isn't a lot of film like that because a lot of the times if you're going to do science fiction or even cyberpunk, people are going to think, you know, like uh, maybe The Matrix or something a little more kind of action-packed and, and fast-paced. And this, like, there's like a cerebral uh, uh, side to Revenant Sun, where it is, 
um, it's not focused like the action isn't first like front and center. Like this is there's a lot of ideas going on with Revenant Sun. And for me, like that's what makes science fiction um that's that's what draws me into science fiction. And I think that creates stories that are that can kind of stand the test of time and last longer, whereas like something more, I guess, action packed, you know, it's like like bubble gum, right? It you know, or or like a cheeseburger. It tastes great, but it doesn't last that long. Whereas, you know, Revenant Sun, there's like there's layers to it. And I think that's what I've found with kind of science fiction that I gravitate to is like the layers to the story and not necessarily you know, like a crazy action fest. Um, was that something you wanted to um, kind of get across with with Revenant Sun in, in your writing? How do you how do you approach that? Because you know, a lot of uh, a lot of the cyberpunk out right now is very, you know, you know, they're action action stories. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, first first and foremost, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Of course. Um, I think for me, when I think about science fiction now, a lot of it goes back to Harlan Ellison. I think I kind of looked to him. I've looked to him for many years as sort of like, like a, like an old uncle, just kind of tapping you on the shoulder and saying, you know, take that out. That's not good. You want to bring a person into the world. Like he, there's a documentary that was done about him that I, I, I used to watch it like once a year. Like I used to watch Blade Runner once a year. <laughs> is called uh, Dreams with Sharp Teeth. So in that documentary, he talked about, like, the idea of, like, verisimilitude, which means you're not going to sit there and try to describe the world to a T. You have to basically get your reader to dis- suspend disbelief. You have to bring them into the world. Once they feel, you know, comfortable with the world, then you can start to explain the character. Then, once you sort of walk them along the path and you can start to, you know, lie to them a little bit and then hit them over the head with what you really want them to see. Like the ideas you want to challenge them with. And I took that to heart. And I think after just reading his stories and just sort of just thinking about how I can make something timeless, it's really what drove me to just write the way that I did Mm -hmm. for this book, because Mm -hmm. Action and stuff, like, there's more action stuff in other stories I've written, but for me, this story was really about, like, just the mind. Mm-hmm. And more, I think more so than anything, what I wanted to write about was stuff that actually affected me personally, but take it and put it in the form of something that was not only, like, easy to market, because cyberpunk, I think, is, you know, dude, you like hackers? Dude, you got, <laughs> like, internet? You got, like cyber police like you got to buy my book because i i'm still trying to make i'm, I'm still a salesman because i'm an independent <laughs> author exactly so like for me i was always like take the things i love twist them just a little bit but i still have to have that part of me that that compels me to write mm-hmm. and finding my finding myself and finding you know light at the end of that tunnel because for me one of the main things why i started writing that book was like the idea of like not being in control of your own memory Mm-hmm. like the way that the main character Stanley deals with that stuff and the way that is, you know, he's questioning his past and things that were like, you know, the stuff that he wakes up every day and thinks about, he questions all that. And there's somebody in his mind that makes him question those things. That's something that happened. Like I talk to myself all the time. Like I think about a childhood memory and then I bring it up to someone in my family and they're like, that didn't happen like that. Don't you remember like this happened and this happened? And I'm like, Oh, that not how i remember it at all (laughs) yeah so like the twisting of the mind is really what started this book that was like like the center piece of it was like the twisting of the mind and like how do i apply that to a futuristic society where if everything's you know digital Mm -hmm. how easy can that stuff be twisted and manipulated like all even down to your very dreams and your thoughts yeah yeah And, and what's so great about revenant sun is how you play with social media and the internet, how everyone's connected, and it plays so well <laughs> to today's society, especially right now as we all have, been, have gone through this kind of going through this pandemic thing. We're doing a lot more online. We're doing a lot more interactions through video, through Skype, through you know, through our phones. Um, 
it's actually causing us to be kind of live more in the cyber realm <laughs> uh, in, in, in our day-to-day -day interactions. And because I was I was narrating this right as all this was starting. And um, so the setup to Revenant's Son, I'll just throw this out there for, for the listeners here is, um, and you can fill in the blanks. I'm awful at giving, <laughs> giving synopsises, but from what I, my understanding of being, being the narrator and things like that. Um, so we had a journalist, uh, Stanley Gabriels. He works for kind of one of the big tech companies and, and he's in charge with, um, you know, posting articles about the, the company and getting information out there into the data stream. Um, and he basically somehow his, his mind, his, uh, gets hijacked in a sense by, uh, and we don't know what it is. And there's a mystery element to this too. Um, by, by, by someone else is in there with him. Um, you know, trying to kind of fight for control over his mind. And, um, there's the discoveries he makes along, along the way. And he, so he's kind of his day to day, boring day to day is kind of, you know, thrown aside. Uh, and, and he's thrust into kind of this mystery and, and trying to figure out who is, has hacked into himself and, who he really is as a person. And like you said, memories and, and, and our own consciousness, you, you play around with, with all that. Um, so he's basically the main, I guess, plot would be him trying to remain or keep the control of his mind um, as he's kind of, you know, uh, hunting down this, this mystery. See, I'm bad at synopsis, but that's a bad, <laughs> that's just the no, you're gist, good. Just it's it. all about, it's all about sound bites, right? That's the thing. So it's like, you know, <laughs> It's not it's not just about him trying to like wrestle control of like his mind. It's like it's it's he's trying to get back control of himself because yeah. he kinda lost himself just being in the machine. And that's right. something I've been just being in the workforce, being a new dad, a new husband, feeling like a cog in the machine and mm -hmm. losing parts of yourself is easy to write about for me because that's I feel like that all day. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, I mean I think we're we are all uh we are all like like that. I mean I was definitely feeling that and connecting to that part of the story where you know there's so much more to this world and this life than kind of our day-to-day -day. and we are all stuck you know in the corporate machine um especially as things become more connected our jobs are more connected um we we have it's like a necessary evil like even with with facebook you know and how face like so many people are like well i'm gonna leave i'm leaving facebook because they're connected with all this stuff well, I'm like, how you, you don't understand how many things you use on a daily basis are connected to a larger machine that yep. you don't even know about. So, and Facebook's kind of becoming a communication necessary evil at this point. Uh, I can't just drop away. I've, I've had friends just leave Facebook. I, I can't. I am too connected to um, my business, my marketing, actual friends. I have actually, you know, actual friendships, conversations. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the fact that we are so connected and in Revenant Sun, everything's happening through like a, an implant in their brains that, the, that this, that part of society, uh, is basically their, their phones are in their heads, um, which is, you know, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, cause I feel like we are moving towards that. <laughs> it's funny too, because I, cause you know that this book was actually like written five years ago so uh -huh. even before that i was in like a writer's meeting in in my town where i live now and there was actually a guy who came in who was like he wasn't necessarily like a science fiction writer but he was actually like somebody who worked in tech and i laid out some ideas for like the idea of the artificial you know user interface that i ended up naming adam in the mm -hmm. story I laid out that template to him and I said, how long do you think that would take for that to actually be become real life? And he said, you know, it's, it's happening now. And then after mm -hmm. that Siri, Cortana, Google home, all that stuff is like, it's manifesting right in front of us. Right. Right. And then what if that became self-aware? <laughs> Not only you know? that, but like, it would like, it's designed to comfort you. So like, Cort right. imagine like you, come home google google homes like your heart rates up sean are you okay let me put on some jazz you know what i mean let me pour you a whiskey like <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i i know we are heading towards that aren't we like i think so it's it's absolutely crazy to think about and that's why i love this kind of science fiction so much this kind of the speculative uh science fiction of, of what could be and um 
I think lately with like, you know, superhero movies and the Star Wars movies, we get a lot of space fantasy, um, a lot of, you know, that, but there's, there's very rare, um, movies and literature that I've read so far. I mean, there's, it's out there. I just, you know, I'm doing so much. I probably haven't, I've, I watch more movies than I read books. Um, and I know it's, I know it's out there, but as far as the popular culture stuff, right, it's all, you know, fantasy. Um, but the speculative, you know, science fiction of what could be like, you know, my minority report, the, the film minority report, um, they actually had like Steven Spielberg actually had like a team of people, futurists come in and say, what would law enforcement be like? What would detective, what would detective work be like in, you know, <clears throat> 30 years from now? And they came in and they yeah. kind of workshop everything. And I love that stuff so much. And, uh, and yeah, like with, with Revenant Sun, even with the class system, you kind of have these, uh, can you explain like the, the society that, that, that our characters are living in that you've, that oh, you've absolutely. built? So like in my, my story, you have basically three different sections. So you have the entertainment section, the work section, and then everybody beneath. Mm-hmm. So they're, they all have their own fancy names, but they're basically different parts of the same machine because you have Tempest, which is where everybody goes to work. They all, you know, you know, no cars. It's all just train based platforms because everybody, everybody's looking like either gigantic tenement towers. You know, everybody's very, you know, economized and very downsized and very efficient. Everybody's got the little boxes that they live in. Cause the and, earth, uh, like something's happened, right? There's, there was some, something happened where, you know, a large percentage of the land is not being used anymore. Is that, so they've all kind of closer together. Yeah, what I tried to do was just do like a combination of things that are happening now and like some kind of cataclysm that like every cyberpunk story starts with, right? Even like Matrix has like second renaissance when the machines fight back and nuke everybody, that kind of deal. Terminator 2, the same thing with Skynet. So like my idea was not just people depleting the resources, but we just basically never stopped fighting each other and then we just ran out of space. And then it was just junk. So we <laughs> used whatever resources we had left to make this giant towers, which the giant towers thing and the plate thing, like that's, that's all homage and like tributes to like stuff that inspired me just growing up. Little mm-hmm. cyberpunk things, like not just Blade Runner, but like Final Fantasy VII, mm-hmm. which got re- remade a few months ago. That's, you know, a huge shout out to Final Fantasy VII, that idea of like the elite on the top and you know the 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 downtrodden sort of on the bottom the bottoms mm-hmm. makeshift trying to survive you know just off of the waste of the people above so you have basically the people underneath just sort of hacking the waste from the people above and then you have the entertainment section which is just where everybody goes to blow off steam and there's you know little subcultures and people hacking and stealing pieces off each other just enjoying and siphoning bits and pieces there to where they can get all the sort of you know benefits of the technology even if they don't have the money to do it the hacking really is what facilitates you know comfort in my Mm -hmm. story and that's that's really what the intro of the book is about is you have a a character that you're basically wanted you to not like the guy but i wanted you to understand why he was doing what he's doing Mm -hmm. and i wanted you to know that he was good at it and he had a way of selling you on the idea of why it needed to be that way because Another part of that hacking culture is social engineering, the convincing, you know, people get hacked every day through, you know, manipulation, through words, through text, you get scared, somebody knows a little bit about you and you freak out, you know, Mr. Robot did a real good job of painting that in the first season, and then it kind of went off the rails in my opinion, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, that is really what I wanted to do was just have that sort of the allure of technology not just the allure of that but like the people who didn't have what everybody else did but like you could grift the system to get it that's really like where that w- that's what fascinates me the most about hacking is like i can get that without having to pay for it i can get that without having to work for it watch yeah. and then like watch that guy do it or that lady go do it and i was like that's cool to me that's like the slick matrix thing now versus like back in 98 when it was like guns and trench coats <laughs> But yeah, the three different worlds. That's what we were talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's all good, man. Yeah, no, and I, I, I like that kind of three, like the three tier system, and I like that the entertainment district 
can bring together the two, you know, the two different worlds and they all kind of, you know, coalesce in this world. And I mean, uh, together and, um, I tell you, like, there's things that stick out just for me being from narrating it and just that it just stuck with me because I lived in the world for, for, so, for so long, it seems like. Um, our main character, Stanley, like, you know, I, I, as the, as the kind of the, the one to drive, I guess, the story along, um, he's kind of, uh, I, I guess, like, the reader has to kind of put themselves in, you know, a little bit. And you say he is, like, a bit unlikable, unlikable at the beginning, and you kind of have to you kind of get to know him through the journey. Um, yeah. I really liked, this characters that I really liked that stuck with me, um, Jaya, just a fantastically written, like, female character. And I love, you know... I was, you know, we we had a conversation before we started recording here, and I kind of was talking to some other authors about this, about how, you know, men writing women, and there's a tendency to, to write, you know, try to describe the women, they're voluptuous, yada, yada, they're only, you know, um, there's an over-reliance on kind of sex and and the, the woman's body, right, and, and some, sometimes um, with, with genre fiction. It happened a lot in the 80s, you know, and... Um, there's a book I narrated called The Brain Eaters where, like, the first thing you learn about the strong woman character is, like, how great her breasts are. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I, I really liked how you introduced Jaya as um, she's spunky, she's smart, she has, you know, she has, like, um, a sexuality to her that she's in control. Um, but the way you handled it was so... It, it was just so smart. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't to basically you know, give, I don't know, mouth breathers a, uh, an imaginary character to draw, you know, fan fiction or whatever. I don't know, <laughs> you know, uh, but she's like a believable, strong, you know, woman, char- woman in the story who just wants to get ahead and just wants to be taken care of by herself. She wants to get where she, she wants to get, um, out of where she is right in, in these slum type area. Um, and she'll kind of do what it takes to kind of try to get, you know, try to get there. And she, uh, yeah. um, I love, well, that's, that's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried about that. I was worried about like initially, like when somebody takes on a story, how they were going to narrate, how they were going to think about the characters. And like, it's kind of funny. I, this might be like kind of crass now cause it's an old movie way back in like end of nineties. But like, you ever see as good as it gets with Jack Nicholson and Greg Kinnear? Yeah. Yep. There's a line where the lady asks uh, Jack Nicholson how she writes women so well, how he writes women so well. And he says, I think of a man and I take away reason and accountability. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I really, that really stuck with me. Cause like, when I think about it, like when I try to write lady characters for me, it's like, it's not that much different from dudes. It's really just, you know, they understand their place in the world. It's not necessarily manipulation, but it's like, you have to, hack the system to get what you need done yes but like there's still like you understand what you have you understand your differences you know what you bring to the table but you know you have to show weakness and vulnerability just like any other character that is great if you don't show that your character is just like a blank it's a blank page you need to fill that with weakness and danger and fear yeah and she she was one of my favorite characters like i said like like Stanley, the main character, was great and everything, but she stuck out, I think, to me. Whenever I got to a Jaya, you know, chapter, I was like, yes! I was excited to narrate Jaya <laughs> more. Just, uh, I connected with, with that character. Um, and even, um, I guess he's not a, I don't know, he's not a bad guy, right? He has his reasons. <laughs> Vax, right. the hacker. Um, I absolutely loved... Um, his reasoning, the, what makes a good villain is you kind of have to, when you, when you think, when you put yourself in their shoes, it has to make sense. And you have to understand like, okay, well, I kind of get why he's doing this, <laughs> you know? And, uh, yeah. and, and I, I totally got that from, from Vax, um, his reasoning for wanting to kind of, uh, uh, I guess, hack into, into Stanley and their their kind of dialogue back and forth. I absolutely loved whenever there was dialogue between those two. Um, and then, uh, yeah, man, another, like, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say it real quick. I just no, want to give it. you props, you props 
I wanted to give you props because there were moments <laughs> like when I was listening chapter to chapter, it was kind of weird because like it was kind of like this is my first time doing any kind of audiobook review or anything. So like uh-huh. just getting one chapter at a time, everything was kind of segmented. So it's like I almost had to like go into the corner. Nobody talked to me. I have to get into my mode right now <laughs> to like listen to the voices and everything. But like the the face off chapters with Stanley and like the voice or the body or like mm-hmm. facts, but what becomes later on when that starts to happen, like there's like a synchronicity where like you get into this zone where like you're a hundred percent believable as this guy, this rigid <laughs> kind of guy in Stanley. And then like this sort of free form chaotic person in Vax. And like, that's yeah. really, that's like, that's exactly like, I like punch my table. I was like, that is exactly <laughs> what I needed because that's when I'm sitting there, like in my own head five years ago, like, like my shoulders are moving, like trying to figure mm-hmm. out this conversation. And I type it as I'm going, I'm going back re-editing. And like, I wanted it to be like just this back and forth. And the way you were able to capture that with voices, like your voice has changed. Like, I wish that I could like put the show on Netflix because like that sort of back and forth of like, if I could visualize that, oh, dude, yeah. that like, I would watch that all day. Oh, it was fantastic. I mean, uh, I, I, I have like, those are probably the easiest chapters for me to kind of get into and, and just go to town and get it done. Um, because like I connected, I, I don't know. I, it, it, there's, and it, it's props to your writing too. And that's what I love about, the narration thing like um it when i when i read a good author when someone um is just firing on all cylinders um i can feel that as the narrator and i know and i also know when a writer is you know young in their career um or just you know <clears throat> has some work to do i can feel i can kind of feel that and and it's harder when it's a more inexperienced um author and I do my best and but there's there's scenes in this in this book that just flowed effortless effortlessly. I knew the characters. <clears throat> I knew I can kind of go in and out. I mean there's editing involved too. I mean I'm not saying here I stood sat here for thirty minutes and read the whole thing. I mean <laughs> there's but as far as the process, uh it was just fun. I would walk out of the booth like, Man, that was great. That was fun. I felt like I was a part of a scene, you know, and, and as an actor, like you really crave kind of that stuff being by yourself and in, in, in a booth that means a lot man thank you so much <laughs> um and uh some other I'm, I'm just kind of running through like the characters that stood out um to me uh and then the finally I, i'm i mean there's so many great then that's the thing like you i asked you like hey can you provide like like cast this like a movie or, or a show and you were great with with what you returned um that's always super helpful um and, like the shot the shadow men um, I had a lot of fun with those guys too, because one of them, I, I was like, I don't know how, I was like, am I going to, am I going to do like the, uh, you know, uh, in like the matrix, right. Um, you know, the, the, the guys, with the sunglasses, right. You know, all those oh, yeah. characters and they just talk like this, you know? And at first when I did my audition, I think I did that. I was envisioning like, you know, um, but then when I got to their, their first scene, I was like, there's like this weird playfulness between these two. Like they're sinister and evil. Um, but they're also like off. They're like aloof. And I, and I was yeah. like, that made it really fun to kind of get into these characters. Maxwell in particular, cause you like, you wrote like he has a sing songy voice. And I was like, I could do that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Real quick backstory for that. I actually got <laughs> the initial inspiration for that. Actually it was from, um, one of Henry Rollins, like spoken word shows. Uh-huh. He tells a story about how he met Iggy Pop for the first time. And basically he's in like this like Hollywood party just there for the free food. He doesn't really know anybody. He's kind of awkward, wallflower. When Iggy walks into the room, he very he describes it like people like the energy of other people like affected him physically. So when he walks into a room, he would see he would notice a person and his body would like jolt to that person and i was like that sounds cool as hell i need to translate that into a like into a character so that's uh-huh. the idea for maxwell and john's initially started like you know take like very stereotypical assassin pulp fiction archetype dudes mm-hmm. but give them my weird twisted take on it so like mm-hmm. you'd have like the straight man but he's very like very clinical very like this guy's fat. I don't like him. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then the other guy is very much like, Ooh, what you, you have a question? Like, wh- why? Like very, like very analytical and very yeah. like, let me tell you about this science thing that I learned. Like 
I wanted like these little non sequiturs, not, you know, almost like Tarantino esque just because I love those kind of things. But like, I wanted like a character that would like similar to Vax, another form of manipulation. Mm -hmm. If it's not digital, if it's not digital, it's verbal. Yeah. It's like, let me, let me run the room. Let me, you know, lead the room, bring you in. And then I'm going to drop something right on the top of your head. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's like, uh, he likes to monologue. Yeah. You know, there's like this, there's a re like he, he's getting to a point, but he's going around kind of enjoying the storytelling aspect of getting to his point. And I found myself, I did find myself like contorting my body, you know, being a little really? more animated, but I was like, <laughs> but I was trying not to make noise, you know? So I'm like, you know, trying to wear like really quiet clothing and, <laughs> you know, but with him, him, especially I found myself, you know, just getting, just getting into it. Um, and, uh, it was fun. So for me, those were the standout, you know, characters that like, if you asked me, you know, uh, what my favorite character is, you know, those ones all stood out and, and, and yeah, like every character, sometimes when I run, when I run into a book that I'm reading, even, even just reading or whatever, sometimes characters, like they all kind of blend together and it's hard to know who's different. And it's hard to yeah. do that. Like, with writing because you're you're relying on the 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 reader to kind of fill in you know fill in the blanks and connect the dots and you don't want to go overboard with the prose or whatever about you know what kind of who they are but you kind of but the way you did i think you you, you sprinkled in things the way that that their dialogue would be how they interacted with each other um it was very easy for me to kind of figure out you know what kind of character they they were um, even on lesser characters, you know, you have, uh, these kind of, uh, like the Irish gang characters, you know, um, uh, even that small, they're not in there that long, but I kind of understood who they were pretty quickly. So, yeah, yeah this was, a, this was a super fun one for me, for me to narrate. I, I, um, I think when you, when we, when we first talked about me narrating and it took forever to kind of get, finally get to it just cause I've been doing this part time and, um, you know. It's hard for me to kind of give people a, I can have this done on this date <laughs> because it's just, well, how's my work day? How's the family? And I'm just kind of chipping away at these, but you were very oh, yeah. patient. But I knew like when I first, when I, number one, the cover is like, people say never judge a book by the cover. That's, I always say that's bullshit. You start, you hook people with the cover. And when I saw the cover, I was like, oh, that's a great cover. And I was like, I really hope it's as good <laughs> as that cover. Because <laughs> a lot of times, you know, new authors, independent authors will spend, you know, spend money on a good cover and the writing will be shit. Um, so I was like, well, okay, let's look at this audition. Let me kind of see. And I read it. And I was like, okay, I really like this audition. I'll send it in. And, you know, hopefully the rest of the book is, is this good. Because sometimes I've, I've gotten tricked with auditions. Um, oh, wow. Where they, they send like their best, you know, page, <laughs> you know. And uh, then I get the whole book, and I'm like, ah, oh, okay, well, let's just get this done. But um, but I read the audition; it was fantastic. And then um, I was, was just, I love it when I'm, when all the, the package is all together, you know, and and you your writing style um, seems to be years ahead of your of your experience. I get, I would say, you know what I mean. Um, well, I mean, how long, how long have you been writing? Cause this was in 2000, you were in 2015, right? Right. So, so Revenant, Revenant came out in December of 2015. So okay. I, I'm, I'm 33. So okay. I, I feel like I'm, it's almost like every time I start a book, the character, the main character is the same age as me. So it's like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to start, I'm going to start this journey with you character. We're going right. to get through this together. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, um, there's. A lot of people can write, um, a lot of, you know, I can write, I don't know if I can tell a story. Um, a lot of people can write, there's a lot of authors, there's a lot of books that, you know, sell fast, make a lot of money fast, but they don't stick, they don't stick with me. And, um, Revenant Sun was definitely was one, you know, when I first, cause I do initial read throughs before I start recording and I did, I did have to work for it. Um, I, I saw some reviews on Amazon or, or Audible about some people were confused, they got lost. Um, this is this is a story that you really have to kind of stick with and pay attention to. You can't you can't have this. You can't be listening to this while you're doing other tasks. Um, 
you need to really like this is one of those books you do have to pay attention to because there's um there's fine threads that are running through each chapter and you're connecting things and there's you're you're switching characters and um but so I, I, I love that. And then when I found out that you were even younger than you are now when you wrote this, I was like, wow, that's you know, the, not a lot of there's not a lot of authors like that. Um that can really put all the puzzle pieces together like like you did. So um sorry, it's like a love fest here, but I really fucking love the book. <laughs> So. Well, I, I, I love you for narrating the book. <laughs> uh, and I don't, I don't do that. I mean, there's books that I do and I'll kind of move on. All right. I got that one done. That was all right. And then move on. And, but there's, there are ones that just stick with me and I'm like, man, like that's, that's a really good one. Uh, I'm going to keep an eye on this author, you know? So, um, so yeah, so, so I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just ram- I just, that's what I do. I just start rambling. Um, when well, I really I, like I something. Think- I, well, well, thank you. But I, I wanted to say, like, you know, when it comes to, like, my own, you know, journey as, like, an author, I think for me it's, a like, not only just with, like, books, but, like, just in life, I'm very much, like, hunkered down in the basement, woodshed forever, <laughs> and when it's ready, it's ready. And then mm-hmm. for me, like, I was thinking about, like, I mean, for years, since, like, when Black Eclipse, the first story came out in 2012, I was even, I mean, I, I started that story in like sophomore year of high school and it took me six years to write it. Uh-huh. And then I've just been sort of just chipping away at that statue ever since just trying uh-huh. to perfect it. Uh-huh. So like for me, it's like not just that, but like there's the marketing part, how to sell yourself. How do I put myself out there? I'm much more like, I really like the blanket of anonymity. So like for me, it's like, I try to put myself out there. Nobody responds. Nobody cares. Go back in my hole, you know, feel bad. <laughs> just try it again later. And like just sort of, even with Revenant, like with the audition thing, like I put it out, somebody was interested. We got to a certain point and he was like, nah, nah, I'm just too busy, too hard. I'll see you later. I was like, wow. <laughs> so like I waited six months and just like on a whim, I put it back out again and you responded like super quickly. So like, I feel like it's kind of like a fate thing, like mm-hmm. keep chipping away until you finally like break that, like, so you finally break through, like break the, the brick wall and yeah. like you make, you make connections and people finally start to get out of like the ether who you are and what you're trying to present. So I feel like even now, like eight years of being like a quote unquote author, Mm -hmm. I'm now just now reaching that moment, like not a plateau, but like just that moment of like, okay, this guy gets it. He put in 11 hours narrating my book. (laughs) I can't stop. Now I got to keep going. (laughs) You're stuck, man. Sorry. Sorry. You're stuck being an author, <laughs> you know, but that, but that is how, that is, that's how it is with, uh, with the arts. Um, if you want to pursue a career in the arts, it's, uh, I, I talk to so many people. I get so many people, you know, asking me like, I want to be a narrator. Uh, you know, I'm, and I'm still young in my journey in this, you know, um, I've only been doing it, I guess a year and a half, I guess. Um, but oh, wow. I, there's, but a lot of other things have led up to this, that moment. You know what I mean? My, college uh my personality uh acting classes in high school and college uh just being a character already (laughs) someone who likes doing voices reading stories to my kids like it's all been building blocks to get to this point and i'm still young i still have in this career um in this career you know i mean i sound younger than i am but um but yeah, it's it's all stepping stones and just chipping away at the statue, like you said, and that's how these that's how these books are. I mean, this is an eleven hour audiobook, and there was times where I was like, man, I'm so behind on on my schedule, but like my voice isn't holding up, or I just I just got to do what I can little by little and to get this book done. And then when it was done, ah, you, you know, the weight was lifted off my chest, and then I realized, oh, I got another book <laughs> waiting for me, but. Yeah. But yeah, but with these careers it, it, uh, in this, it's it's a long game. It's a you know, it's, it's that classic marathon, not a sprint thing. And so oh, yeah. many people think that I want to be an author, I want to be a narrator, I want to be an actor. Um, that's great that you have the drive, but it's 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 gonna take some time. And I think it, I feel like it's even harder for authors to kind of break through the wall because there's so much competition. Um, so many people especially with the boom of independent, you know, independent books and, and, and audio or and Amazon and anybody can 
throw a book on Kindle. Anybody. Um, and I see it. Uh, you know, um, people think they can make it, make a, uh, make a quick buck turning out, you know, one book a month. But, but like I said, like, I can tell that you put in the time with your writing, um, to really create something special. And I, th and I think like that kind of writing, those kind of books for me are the ones that last longer and hopefully get discovered later because it's time, it's timeless. And this is something that we can pick up 10 years from now. Somebody could pick up 10 years from now and go, oh, what's this book? And read it and get the same, um, the same kind of fulfillment out of reading that story. You oh, know, yeah. there's, that's what's, I think that's what I really like uh, the most about it is kind of the, the timelessness of it. And yeah. And there's, a, there's, a, there is a cinematic scope to it. I, I, I read it like a movie. So, yeah. So that we've already kind of done it. Like with, uh, I always like to kind of, start ending the sh closing the show off with kind of advice to those people pursuing this stuff. I mean, we're, we're both, you and me are both kind of still young in this game. Um, even though we have a lot of kind of experiences leading up to it. Um, any other advice you would give to somebody like a young a aspiring author? Um, Oh man. Um, I feel like I've been name dropping this whole podcast, but I feel like that's like, <laughs> if this is, if this is the only podcast I ever get to do, then I'm just going to name drop like what I know and what helped me. So like, but I talked yeah. about Harlan Ellison yep. in terms of like how to <clears throat> make the world seem real, but don't make it too real. Like you have to basically like invite them in. Um, mm -hmm. I talked about, I would say another thing like that was really helpful was like some words from like Bukowski. Like it was like an old interview where he was talking about like every sentence, every page is like there has to be something taking place every moment somebody speaks, every moment you put the pen down. He like he's kind of drunk on wine in the interview, but he's like bim bim bim. <laughs> like that was his thing. He always said you can find it on YouTube. It's like every line is bim bim bim. Like there has to be like there's a movement, like musical, mm -hmm. poetic, mm -hmm. sort of like you have to carry somebody on this little ride. So like when you're mapping out not just dialogue, but mapping out action mapping out the scene, everything has to have like a flow to it. And that means if there's a conversation with somebody, like two people, I try not to do more than two people because then it gets tough. Um, that's like one of my things. I'm still trying to work on like multiple people talking. I try to keep it very, the conversations and dialogue very intimate because I want, yeah. I want somebody to, as, as a reader, I want them to see, okay, two viewpoints, you know, what's the motivation? What are they trying to sell me on? Like, what are you trying to get at? What are you trying to get at? You know, where where are you taking me? So like the bim, bim, bim thing, how I apply that is if you basically have, you know, a conversation going on, you know, you have a line of dialogue and then you have an observation. You have a line of dialogue and then a thought. You have hesitation. You want to basically notate all those moments as if you were nervous yourself talking to somebody you never met before. Like you want all the different doubts and emotions to come across on the page. And that's what carries you in the story like you're basically like manifesting the emotions that you would have if you were freaking out so like mm -hmm. that's really what helps me so like all the face-off chapters i thought about the bim 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 thing of like okay if somebody i've never met before was like trying to call me out on my shit i never even met them but they know my whole history they know my dreams and they're trying to use it against me how do i defend myself mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where that comes from so like for me for like any advice for like young writers and stuff, like take real experience, take times that you were like on the verge of tears, like any kind of emotion and channel that, but like write out every single, like the sequence of emotions, because that that's real life. Yeah. That's how your characters should feel the same way you did. Yeah. I don't know. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's, that's fantastic. And you know, they, they do say, write what you know. And some people think that, like, well, then I can't write science fiction because I don't know what it's like to be in a spaceship. Well, it, it it doesn't matter if you're in a spaceship or if you're in a car. You know, we're all human. Um, right. And emotion doesn't change. And so, yeah, no, that's that's great. I think a lot of people kind of overstretch themselves or they 
or they don't even want to get started because they don't know how to, you know, write a space fantasy about a dog man and a, you know, elk woman. I don't know. Like, but even though it's a dog always, man and, and an elk woman. <laughs> I've always uh, loved you, elk woman. I've always loved you. <laughs> there's still like real connection and real emotion that you can play with. That's real. So write what yeah. you know. I, I think uh, I've always kind of thought about that. And whenever I, I used to want to write, and it's one of those things I may pick up uh, down the road here if I ever go full time with this. But Do um, it. I'll narrate it. I'll narrate it. Do it. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yeah, that sounds good. We'll swap roles. Yeah. I'm all about that. So, no, that, that's fantastic. And, and I, I think your point about just keep going, um, don't give up. If it's something you're passionate about um, and it's something you feel you can do well, um, you're going to. You're gonna get a lot of speed bumps. A lot, yeah. a lot of things are gonna come in your way, and you're gonna think that you're not good enough. I mean, I, I have that every time a audiobook releases, the one and two star reviews. Those are the things that used to really trip me up, but um, I've learned to kind of ignore those because those aren't building me up and pushing me towards where I need to go. Yeah, you know, those, those are just distractions. Um, so yeah, always, always keep moving, moving forward, and and uh and keep chipping away it may take a year two years three years it may take 10 years but i think if you're passionate about it you know just focusing on the long game i think is the the best thing you can do revenant sun is available on on amazon you can get it on the kindle you can get the audiobook you can also even get the physical copy which i have the physical copy um where can people find find more of your work Besides Amazon, there's also bookshop.org. I just found out about them recently. It's like <laughs> sort of like um, it's not like it's more of like alternative to Amazon. If you're not really feeling oh, Amazon, yeah, and you want to just support yes. like local bookstores. Bookshop is. I just found out about them, and like the soup, the website is super easy to just go in and say, "Hey, these are my books." Like I just typed in the ISBNs, and it came up super fast. I was like, "Wow, these guys are legit." So bookshop is a good spot. Um, besides Amazon. Well, the way that it's set up now, because Amazon bought out CreateSpace, you could, if you just Google the book, you'll find like it's on Barnes and Noble or Walmart or pretty much everywhere. Because okay, cool. Amazon has like they, you know, they've got like a trillion dollars, so they bought out all the connects and the channels and things. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I would say yeah, Bookshop or Amazon is the, the easiest way to find my stuff, or okay. just help or send me a message on Twitter, uh, Troubled Sleep, and I'll send you writing or whatever you want. We'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And do you have a website or? I have like a WordPress. I'm still working on a website. I'll okay. I'll I'll link you the website. Um, but, okay. Um, it's it's out there. It's it's in the works. I'm a slow guy. Everyone just <laughs> just just Google Eric Danhoff or Revenant Sun. You'll find what you need. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And uh, anything uh, anything you're working on? I know, like like me, this has kind of been a you know our passions are are our side gigs right now. Um, but is there anything that you're currently working on? Well, I like to like. I like these little interview moments. Like they're so few and far between for me. I like to make like little time capsules of these moments. So like at the moment I'm working on a collection of short stories and poems that are basically a tribute to my family, my daughter, and it's called diamond blood. And it's going to basically be illustrated by my four year old, like a painting. <laughs> awesome. I, I was thinking about maybe doing like, my own version of like a young adult series, but mm -hmm. like, I don't know. I'm still like kind of tiptoeing around that, but we'll yeah. see. I'm just, I'm going maybe like five years from now. I don't know. I'm just going to make yeah. it like super far away. And if it happens, it happens. <laughs> but I've been reading, doing a lot of research on like YA like series. Cause like even people like coworkers, like you should do the next twilight. And I'm like, uh, I don't know if I can do that. Why? Maybe YA I is one of those things that like, it's so oversaturated, but there's like, there's a bunch of like, it's, they're all okay, but they follow like the same, you know, cookie cutter, you know, it's just dystopian. There's a love triangle. There's some authoritative I thought regime. About, I thought about that. You know, but. But then I was like, you know what? If if we twist it a certain way, like exactly. maybe we did a YA, but it was like, what if it was in like twisted. the roaring 20s? You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Right. We could deal away with that, right? That's Would you read a so. YA about the roaring 20s? Yeah, let's do it. Why not? Or all right, I, I, alternate universe twenties with steampunk. Uh, I don't know if I've seen a steampunk YA other than uh, I don't know. 
We can talk. We'll all workshop right. it. We'll workshop it. All right. I guess we'll, we'll see like two years from now if that's going to be yeah, real or not. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, Time YA is one of those. Time capsule, I'm telling you. It's, it's that genre that is booming. Um, romance and YA, right, are the two that seem to be booming. And I'm like, haven't narrated any <laughs> of those. Uh, I've done one, like maybe one. Bite of the Fallen was maybe can be a combination of the two. But um, it's, I think like, I think it's so easy when things sell well to just get it out there and get it done. But uh, I like things that will last. I like things that will kind of stand the test of time. So I haven't, I haven't personally, there could be out there, could be out there. I haven't personally found a YA series that I'm like, wow, this thing is, uh, is awesome. May, maybe the Maze Runner series is the only of the movies that I've really enjoyed. Um, Are the but books then I, any good? I don't know. I heard that, but I, and then I, I heard thing, things like the author was a creep. I don't know. I don't know, but uh, oh, no. I, haven't, I have not read them. <laughs> I don't know. I heard. I just, you know, during the meet during, during the whole Me Too thing, there was names were being dropped all over the place, and that author was oh. was one of them. So oh, I don't no. know. I don't have the facts. I just know what I saw. But the movies are fantastic. I did. I interviewed the director a couple years back um, on my other podcast that I'm not doing anymore. It's still out there. Um, but uh, all right. See, this is what happens. I go on rabbit trails and I don't wrap up the show. So. <laughs> Eric, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. All of you, thank you for listening uh, to my rambling self. And uh, you can all, always find me over at SeanDeragerNarrates.com or you can go to uh, ScreamingPods.com and uh, find all the, all the stuff there. Um, all right. So, Eric, thanks again. And uh, everyone, I'll talk to you next time. Thank you.